Good day, everyone. Uh, I'm Amy Myers Jaffe. I am the co-chair of the steering committee of the Women in Energy Program at the Center on, on Global Energy Policy at Columbia University. Uh, welcome to today's event. Let me tell you a little bit about the Women in Energy Program. Our aim is to elevate women in the energy sector by advancing equality, inclusion, and opportunity at all stages of professional development. Create, and we create content that addresses and institutional barriers to entry and long-term success in the energy sector. Uh, we hope so in doing so with today's event and other kinds of events, hopefully soon in person, uh, we'll foster networks and learning that will enhance the energy business today. So to that end, we have a great panel. Uh, we're going to look at the uh, prospects in the United States for uh, the build out of clean energy infrastructure, new um, opportunities emerging from the 2021 Infrastructure and Jobs Act, and, um, and, and what this bill and the related public spending is going to mean for clean tech firms and project developers. Um, we do know uh, myself included from studying uh, the 2009 um, stimulus program um, that women and minority led businesses receive 10, less than 10% of the billions of dollars that were distributed a decade ago. Uh, Jigger Shah of the Department of Energy's new uh, jazzed up loan program um, aims to change that. And the Biden administration has stated its aim to make equity and inclusion a priority. So we couldn't have a better panel today um, to talk about the opportunities um, and some of the institutional barriers uh, than the group we've assembled for you today. Our moderator will be Emily Chasson, who is the Director of Communications at Generate Capital, a major player. Uh, she brings a wealth of knowledge about both not only the energy sector, but clean tech. Uh, she's had a long experience uh, in that field uh, that included serving as the uh, sustainable finance editor at Bloomberg News, among other positions. Um, so I'm gonna ask Emily to uh, kick off our discussion today. Uh, we've gotten to know each other through the Energy Gang podcast, which has been, um, very enjoyable. We've talked about this subject uh, online, so encourage you to come and because you know it's podcast. You can listen to us while you're driving or doing something else. So come and hear Emily and I uh, at Energy Gang. Uh, but in the meantime, Emily, uh, let's kick off today's session. Great, thank you, Amy. Um, thanks for doing this and inviting me to host such a great session on such an important topic right now. Um, so as mentioned, I'm Emily Chase and I'm Director of Communications at Generate Capital. And I used to be at Bloomberg where I helped sort of pioneer and begin coverage on sustainable finance and ESG. And I moved to Generate about a year and a half ago because I wanted to work more directly in climate solutions. And here we are in this amazing infrastructure growth period um, with the Biden bill that just came out. Um, there's actually just a ton of funding all over from the private sector, from the government sector. Um, I have a few numbers on that that I looked up that, you know, governments, investors, technologists have just poured so much money into clean tech at the fastest rate in history. Um, we're sort of looking for breakthrough inventions, looking for proven technology, all the different ways that we can get into climate investment. So there's been over 33 billion in the past year, two years, maybe more than that, been put into climate tech. Um, it's been the best years in five years for clean tech funding um, from what was actually a very small amount before. Um, and then if you look at governments around the world, there's Europe um, putting billions and billions into green recovery plan and also the Biden bill with 1.1 trillion, which is a historic amount of infrastructure investment over the next few years. So it's a really amazing time to be um, an entrepreneur in this infrastructure space, we're always talking about how the energy transition just creates amazing opportunities. And um, it's an amazing opportunity specifically for entrepreneurs. So I'm really pleased to have this amazing panel with us today. Um, let me talk to you and introduce you a little bit to the panel. Um, as Amy mentioned, before we begin, I just wanna quickly say that the event's webcast live and the full video will be available online in the next few days. 
Um, and if you have any questions for the panelists at any time, just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Um, we're happy to try and weave those into the discussion. Um, also, there's closed captions, so you can turn the captions on by clicking the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. And um, let me introduce the great panelists we have with us today. So we have Alexandra Rash Castillo, she's founder and CEO of Cabin Systems, and Janice Tran, CEO and co-founder of Canon Energy. Um, so why don't we start, maybe you guys can tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey um, to entrepreneurship um, in this space and like why you chose infrastructure versus some other type of technology or you know why you wanted to lead a company in infrastructure. So um, Janice, why don't we start with you and tell us a little bit of your story, which is similar place to my own in some way. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Um, thank you so much for having me. And um, I remember as a Columbia student, I would go to these uh, energy and women events. So <laughs> it's so fun to be on the other side now. Um, but yeah, so a little bit about my my story and how I got to, to this place at Canon. Um, so I've always been fascinated about this intersection of uh, finance and clean energy and infrastructure. So I'm actually an accountant. Uh, grew up in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, which is kind of the heart of um, oil and gas in, in Canada. So it's kind of been around me forever. Uh, prior to starting Canon, I was actually <laughs> very similar to Emily. I was at Generate Capital, one of the, the early employees there. And really like most of my time there was spent on uh, this group called Waste to Waste Value. So I was looking at things that were not very glamorous, like you know cow poop and, and compost and how to make something valuable from that and uh, fund that infrastructure. So it really got me thinking that there's there's actually quite quite an impact on what I call these like forgotten sectors. Um, and it can actually be, be quite lucrative. So my approach to entrepreneurship has always been like, if no one else is doing it, you should go do it. Um, you're, you know, if you see something, you should go ahead and do it. And so that's kind of what happened with, with Canon. My, my friends in, in Calgary, they said, hey, we see this, um, the sector is very much part of the energy transition where if you go to industrial sites, uh, there's a lot of waste heat that's just currently vented into the, into the atmosphere. You have a lot of experience in turning waste into a valuable product. Well, what if we turned this waste heat into base load clean energy? Very much like geothermal um, heat to power, but you know we're we're on these sites that need to decarbonize and, and need the help. So, can you help me kind of start it? And going back to my original mantra of if there's no one else that's you know taking the that responsibility, then you should just step in and, and go do it. And so that's that's how Canon was formed. So uh, we've been around for about 18 months now and things have been been really good. We're definitely in the heart of you know, the energy transition, which we can talk about. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Rose. Welcome back with a few questions on follow up on that. But Alexander, I'd love to, you to hear your story and share how you sort of took this journey to entrepreneurship yourself as well. Yeah, sure. First of all, thank you for having me. And uh, thank you, Amy, for having me as well. Um, I don't come from Columbia background, but um, Amy and I met when I was uh, an undergrad at Rice. I actually took a couple of her classes, so uh, very inspired by her and everything that she's she's done in the past. And so um, I wanted to highlight the importance of, of having, you know, mentors and having people to look up to. So, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, so my um, my, my background is, uh, is in engineering. I, I did my undergrad and my master's in engineering. And since I was, a, I, I grew up in a, in a rural parts of, of Central America. So very keen on working on technologies that would alleviate some of the, some of the pollution pressure on, on the environment. So, um, I did my undergrad and my master's in engineering. And then, uh, for, for a while worked in, uh, uh Lawrence Berkeley national lab, uh, doing, um, heavy heavy metal remediation from groundwater. And then uh, I transitioned over to the energy sector completely. Um, I uh, was a lead designer in uh, the, uh, I was a lead designer in uh, the high voltage uh, electrification of vehicles uh, at Proterra for a while that uh, I let, I helped lead the battery team and eventually the, the vehicle chassis team and the infrastructure team that included um, charging infrastructure as well. Um, and then I wanted to uh, I wanted to make a technology that would be applicable not only to the U.S. but be applicable in the um, worldwide. Um, I I, uh, I always saw the energy energy transition as being important not only in developed countries but across the board because it's gonna it's gonna require everybody to to work uh, towards to work together uh, on solving and, and coming up with solutions and implementing them. 
And so, um, and so I decided to start Gavan. Uh, we uh, design and manufacture energy storage solutions for critical infrastructure that's specific for telecom. So uh, we help the telecommunication industry, which um, a, quick, a quick interesting fact is the telecommunication industry emits more um, GHG or, or emits higher carbon than, um, than all of the aviation industry combined. Um, and uh, we don't really think about the, you know, we don't really think about telecom as being uh, impactful, but the ability for you to send an email or take a call uh, anywhere uh, right now around the world um, has an entire supply chain aspect and an entire sort of uh, infrastructure aspect that supports um, us consumers. Um, and a lot of that is very, still very dirty today and it's still very outdated. And so that was the opportunity that I saw is how to take, uh, how, to, how to make a list of all of the hardest problems to solve and the most impactful and let's tackle those. And telecom industry was one of those. Um, that uh, that requires innovation, and it's an industry that it's consistently always evolving, um, always evolving, and always consuming more more power. Especially as five G comes online, and also especially as uh, as we consume more data. And so the decarbonization of data is something where I wanted to um, where where I wanted to spend my time on. This is great. Um, I really liked the discussion and how you talk about you know what infrastructure really is, is sort of like providing resources, making sure that you can do what you wanna do. I always think of infrastructure as a little bit invisible, right? And when you work in that space, you have to make it visible and see the choices we're making and what we're baking into our process. And that's really what we're talking about all the time in this decarbonization um, pathway. And so I'm curious, you know, the pathway to building infrastructure is really different from other industries. It's not like software where you have like two guys in a garage and their dog and you, you come up with, something, you know, you have a lot of it's big projects often, you have a lot of people, communities involved, um, policymakers, uh, incentives to navigate, you know, how did you think about, you know, being an infrastructure entrepreneur in this space and not some other type of vertical like software, you know, how did you think about um, bringing all those people together and um, building a company in such a different kind of way than we're used to thinking about the way people build companies? Janice, do you want to start? Yeah, I can talk about that. Um, we're definitely in a period where climate tech and climate in general is really hot. Um, but I think that many of the people in the sector or who are coming into the sector don't truly understand what infrastructure is or project finance is. Um, when we were doing our initial fundraise, uh, the majority of the investors that we spoke to did not understand project finance or really infrastructure. They came from a software background or their LPs were really focused on just funding software. Um, so we kind of look like a weird stepchild of the climate tech boom, uh, which, which I find it interesting because the heart of climate change is carbon dioxide and other global warming gases. Um, you cannot reduce those gases without installing new infrastructure. This is an infrastructure problem. It's not like if you think of you know, the internet boom, you are creating new infrastructure that was virtual. But here we actually have to recreate our physical infrastructure. And when you think of like you know, COP26, there was a coalition put together that, uh, that committed $136 trillion to mitigating climate. Where do you think that money is gonna go? It's gonna go to infrastructure. Um, so I think there is like a fundamental disconnect right now between, you know, what solutions are needed for actually solving climate. And that is, you know, hard hardware, it's infrastructure, some software, of course, um, and the money and the capital that's going to support that. Um, so I think maybe, you know, coming from generate capital, that was that was reality and we were in those hard to decarbonize sectors, looking at infrastructure, looking at this very kind of complicated way to do business. Uh, so it's kind of normal to me, but I do think that if we're going to pull along the rest of the climate community, we need to do a better job. The, the infrastructure world uh, needs to do a better job of, of educating you know, all the different ways and how this change is really gonna work. Yeah, Alexander, I'd love to hear your take on that too. I guess, yeah, infrastructure is a lot, it's a different way of thinking about the world um, and what needs to happen to do that. We're very used to 
as I said, sort of building companies in um, a way and the finance system has this sort of machine like to find the next unicorn. And that's not really what we're trying to do at infrastructure. Um, so Alexander, I'd love to hear your take on, on that and you know how being an entrepreneur in this space is, um, is a little bit different for people so they understand. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and you're right. I mean, infrastructure is what really makes the world work, um, not, not a nice suffer app. <laughs> um, this is what really makes us, um, you know, have an impact and, and it really resonated what you just said, Janice. Um, just in general, when we started, when I started the company, um, we were always this um, company in limbo because we weren't really software, we weren't really hardware, um, we weren't really, uh, we were, we weren't really just focused in the U.S. We were focused globally, and so there was always a misfit with investors that we that we that we presented the company to. Um, and ultimately, the the reality is we do everything. We do software, firmware, hardware, uh, deployments, construction project finance, operations and maintenance, and, um, and contracts. And so it is, it is very kind of challenging to do all of the things at the same time. Um, but the, the funny part is we did start in a garage with two dudes, well, me and my dude and my co-founder, uh, who's, our, who's our CTO and, and my good friend, Brian. Um, we did start in a garage because we do, um, we did our very first prototypes. We were both kind of battery engineers by background. And so we did start in a garage uh, dealing up with our first with our first prototype. And that's how we slowly started getting slowly started getting money um, in the door. And we did our first seed with with um, with, uh, with, with kind of venture based. And then as we started growing, uh, I think the trend was to uh, to look for institutional investors that had some sort of strategic play around infrastructure and specifically telecom. So we got, rather than getting a suite of investors that were um, kind of bullish on climate tech, uh, climate tech as defined by software, there were, there were investors that were interested in us because it helped their infrastructure grow. And so it was, uh, it was very kind of strategic investors, which, which is a complication on its own. Um, but uh, but I do I do think that as we sort of matured and, and we're probably a little bit different we're four years in um, and we're a little bit different in that there is a there's a vertical that is investment into product development investment into um, into building a manufacturing line we we have a a battery manufacturing line here in Burlingame um, and then we're transitioning to have a bigger manufacturing line outside of California um, but uh, we do investment into capacity into uh, into product development and then quite separately we have a different sort of arm that looks at how do we how do we deal with project finance because some of the the transition from the status quo, which in the telecom industry in a lot of ways is, is you know, generators and, and lead acid battery packs, the transition to that is a big investment ask from, from an operator's perspective. And so we help them transition to, uh, to renewable energy-based solutions um, in lithium ion, which is a lot you know, better, better life uh, expectancy. Uh, through project finance and through energy as a service transactions, whereby it's they invest zero money up front and it's a monthly reoccurring fee for 10 years. And so that's that's a way to alleviate and help them transition at a larger scale, not on a site by site basis, but we're talking about, you know, multi-million dollar projects that can move the needle. And so that's that's a little bit of of um, of how uh, I think of, of how difficult it is to start an, an infrastructure company and uh, I do. I do want to challenge a lot of investors uh, into thinking about infrastructure a little bit differently, in that not to be so scared of it because it is so essential to our, to our, uh, to our livelihood. Honestly, in the next couple of years, or in the next, yeah. And so, um, and so, uh, the, the sort of transition towards that, it, it needs to be enabled by upfront investment that is not necessarily completely venture-like because that has its challenges as well, but, uh, but there need, needs a, the, this middle ground needs to exist where you don't immediately go to a private equity fund because then you're, uh, I would say you're pretty undervalued at that point. 
Yeah, that's a really natural segue into um, the next question. And I love how you're saying about sort of like thinking um, in advance and what we're what we're building right now. I think um, infrastructure and people who build real assets really think deeply about you know 30 years ahead and like the full lifetime of the asset that they're building and how it's going to enable and connect with other assets over that long period. So it's really sort of um, you should be like kind of a futurist <laughs> in some ways um, and think about where the world is going. And we are so sure that we have to go on this decarbonization path. So I know you're both really in the sustainability um, space. So the next question I had for you both was I wanted to ask, you know, how you are sort of spending your time as an entrepreneur and a leader in this space. You know, infrastructure deployment is this very unique combination of technology on one hand, energy and resource provision on the other, and then also finance, because the way you get, um, something repeated a lot or something built a lot is to use finance to, to grow it. Um, so at clean energy entrepreneurs, we know you need so many different types of capital. That's what we do at Generate Capital is just try and find the most flexible types of capital available um, to sort of support the ultimate goal there and what the actual mission of the entrepreneur is. But there's so many different needs. Um, there's project finance in this space. There's the loan guarantee program from the government. There's the incentive programs. There's the infrastructure bill. There's venture capitalists, banks, lenders. Um, how do you know where to spend your time on finance? And what do you think of the... Um, cost of capital right now. So um, let's start with uh, Janice on that. Yeah, I think um, the capital landscape has really changed over the past, um, you know, I've been in climate finance, I guess, for seven years now. And it's just, it's really changed from like the, the early days to now. Uh, there's a lot more, there's a lot more different types of capital, that's for sure. Um, project capital is, um, I think more abundant, uh, just because you know with low interest rates, a lot of these in traditional infrastructure investors and oil and gas investors are trying to put you know larger amounts of dollars into uh, infrastructure and larger private equity deals. Um, so that's been that's been interesting to see kind of as an entrepreneur. I think, um, like I said, kind of earlier, the changing landscape of like early stage venture capital has really changed. We're going into this like clean tech 2.0, you know. Uh, frame here where a lot of the uh, generalist VCs as well as new VCs continue. I kind of I feel like a re-announcement of a new VC like every other day um, popping up in the space. But uh, I think, you know, as investors are looking at what are the trends that are going to be moving and growing like clim climate tech, clean tech, sustainability is one of those places so you're seeing a lot of that influx of capital. However, I do think that especially for investors that are Kind of coming that are new in this space, um, there's uh, maybe a deeper understanding of how companies are made through the entire life cycle. So from like, as Alex said, you know, same, same from my side, you know, it was, you know, three people in a garage and we created Canon. Now we have a really, you know, not super glamorous office, but we're outside of the garage now in an office, but you know, it's still a small, a small business um relatively small and how do you kind of nurture a company like ours into a, a much larger infrastructure type company um, it needs a capital and coordination of capital through the entire stage so i think you know again like climate entrepreneurs like ourselves we need to uh, help uh, educate the community and investors themselves you know talk to each other about okay how do we bring companies through that stage because if we think about the the urgency of the climate problem and what you know the amount of companies that need to be creating those solutions um, we just need to be pushing companies through that funnel a lot faster and have a lot more companies be created as well so yeah i think the coordination is a big piece for me yeah definitely it's coordination of so many um different parties uh to get this off the ground and it's interesting to have like sort of small companies building big projects often um and that's sort of an interesting dynamic i think to navigate uh alexander can you just tell us a little bit from your perspective, you know, what, what do you think about your approach to financing and um, how you spend your time on that and aligning your capital stack with your goals? Yeah, I'd say it's it's always a challenge. It's it's on my mind. Uh, I, I at a minimum spend twenty five to thirty percent of my day every day thinking about that or we're actually executing it. Um, there's um, so initially we did start with um, with a couple of um, with a couple of non-diluted grants through the California public, uh, the CEC in California, um, there was a. There's always, um, I would say, California is very um, 
we're very fortunate to be here because not only at Proterra, which was my, my previous company, but 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 now at Kaban, we did engage the CEC with various different um, programs that they have open, Epic program being one of them, which is really encourages sort of um, new technologies or existing technologies that are ready for for com for commercial applications. Um, and it, it, it really helps them think about the equipment that's needed for uh, building the sort of the low volume production. And so um, we got uh, we got a couple of grants from them that really helped us uh, early on get equipment. Um, as we've been growing, we've relied on the strategic investors as just the the kind of what I what I alluded to before. Um, and the reason why we want to align with them is because in this in, in the it's better to have strategic investors earlier on. You can get um, you know your doors open. You can get you know sometimes a direct placement of your assets into their network and things like that. Um, I think that uh, we do heavily rely on. Uh, this is a, a new trend that we've been seeing in the infrastructure world around real assets, uh, a structured a structured finance sort of um, approach to, to funding, which is a mix of both debt and equity. And the, the debt portion is uh, really helps fund any type of inventory needs because that's really our biggest drag is, is, is inventory. Um, you need hardware, you need uh, for hardware applications and solutions, you need raw material um, and the raw material needs to be ready so that your production facility continues to operate and there's no downtime on the facility. Um, on the actual manufacturing line. And so the way to think about that is to have a some sort of a, you know, a revolving uh, facility that helps you maintain your inventory levels as needed without uh, without too much dilution on the sort of equity side. But um, it's it's aligned because the equity side is sort of uh, provides uh, a, a, a an incentive for that for that facility to continue running. Um, and so that's sort of on the on the sort of product side, and then enabling the customers a little bit different. And the enablement is done through project finance. So it's done through um, a, a specific vehicle where investors come in and they help um, own the assets, and then you just maintain the assets over time. And I think um, all of those. All of those things need to be in place. So the equity stack for you to grow as a company and to continue you know, paying, paying people and, and product development, um, the, the, the debt portion around, um, around the inventory side and the project finance side. So those three things need to be perfectly aligned. And sometimes they're not. And when they're not, they can be, you know, it can be devastating. And so um, it's always important to think about buffers and it's always important to think about the uh, structuring, structuring a transaction where um, all of those three things are aligned because when they are aligned, the transactions are, or the projects can be north of 20 million at any given time. And so it just has to be all perfectly lined up. Today we have uh, a little bit north of 40 million in uh, in uh, in our production queue, so in, in contracted values, so that we can continue. Um, so right now we're we're strictly focused on uh, on our backlog. We have a bad backlog until September of, of this year, and uh, the sort of the equity portion is really uh, we're in the process of raising our Series B, which the equity portion would give us uh, a capabilities of manufacturing a higher throughput, so that we can bring in the backlog. So that's a little bit of how we how we think about projects, but they're all they're all triggered by one another, and they're all very much tied. Yeah. I'm that's, um, that's really great, like first world experience about, you know, all the things that you're, um, you're going through and how you're thinking about the process. So thank you for sharing that, Alexandra. Um, I wanted to ask you, Janice and Alexandra, both also to talk a little bit about all this federal funding that's coming into the space and the grants. And obviously, we've seen in the clean energy space, I've heard companies from Tesla through, you know, all the different companies in uh, clean tech where they've just really been helped out a lot by you know initial incentives and sort of getting things off the ground and then the other investors come in so what do you think today is sort of the importance of this federal capital in the space given there's also so much private capital coming in you know as an entrepreneur how do you think about balancing both of those especially um when the government is starting to uh deploy finance into that space janice yeah, let me start. Yeah, the, I think the uh, 
US DOE and other many other actually programs within uh, or uh, departments within the DOE are announcing different type of climate infrastructure uh, grants or policies or uh, programs. Actually, today or yesterday, I just read one on uh, manufacturing and making sure that the manufacturing base within the United States, um, there's money and programming to help them transition and to help them be more green. So uh, I think that's that's amazing. The um, unique, so to your point about there is a lot of capital out there um, and you know how do we coordinate that with government funding? I think government funding um, plays a unique role because they are able, especially you know if you think about maybe the US DOE loan program, they're able to take uh, certain types of risk because they have the resources to, to do that. Um, when it comes to technology, for example, they have like an entire team that looks at like new technologies. Whereas if you look at say a, a mid-sized bank, doing maybe a similar type of loan, they wouldn't have like that um, human infrastructure to be able to, to do the pro proper due diligence. Um, and I think when you look at say like green banks, some more regional green banks that um, again, they're able to, to kind of step in and not take, we're, I don't think we're asking governments when it comes to like loan programs to take risk that is risky with public dollars, unless it's a grant, right? I think there's a fundamental difference between grants and loans. I think where the loan programs come in, not just the DOE, but also like green bank loans, for example, they're just able to put a little bit more resources and properly um, due diligence the risk where there might be perceived risk, you know, getting, getting out of that and into like real risk territory. So I think that's like, that's the catalyzing uh, power of government loan programs. Um, but government loan programs, it's still a loan. There is large check sizes that are involved, uh, really high due diligence costs that are involved. That stuff doesn't come cheap. So for kind of, um, I think for later stage companies that are, um, I think uh, one of the DOE loan program award recipients was, was Monolith uh, to build a billion dollar um, essentially like refinery. And that that makes sense. We need that money there. But what about kind of like the non-grant but government funding for you know smaller companies that are looking to grow that are Series A, maybe Series C? And so I think that um, maybe is a gap still. And to the point that the private capital uh, is not necessarily there. Um, I just don't necessarily see a lot of the the funding from the private capital side on corporate capital for the infrastructure companies. So I think that there's still a gap there. Again, I think when investors take a more holistic approach of what is the full capital needs of a company that is growing uh, throughout its stage uh, and making sure that there are no gaps, that's where maybe investors can make money and it will require different types of LPs and things like that to, to create those funds. But that's where the gap is. So even though there's a lot of money, there's still a gap. Yeah, that's really insightful about just sort of um, getting the investment industry uh, acquainted a little bit better. As broadly with how companies grow and how you can grow in this energy transition at the same time. Um, Alexandra, I'm curious what you think about balancing, um, you know, federal or local incentives versus, you know, private capital and how you think about that at your company. Yeah, no, and um, so for us, we didn't even consider a loan program early on because it was, um, it wasn't even an option at early stage, right? Uh, this the notion of like perceived risk was is very much uh, present. Obviously, um, in loan programs, you want to make sure that you have you know contracts that 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 tie the capital to a specific commercial agreement, um, and there is limits to the use of funds ultimately. And so, um, and so it is very I see those types of loans as being just one vertical of supporting in the entire stack of, of, of capital that is needed to actually succeed. And so um, working with, in the private sector, having an option of doing both equity, um, both equity, uh, in, uh, in the, the revolver, so the, 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 debt, the debt portion and then the private, uh, and then the, the project finance side, we did find a really good partner that does all three for us, which is, 
um, which is really, really, it, it's fantastic for, for us to partner with them. They're, they're based out of, out of New York, Ember Infrastructure, and we've had a, a really good sort of success kind of working with them on all three stacks. And, and I think that in terms of, you asked the question before, how do you spend your time? And so I measure that as what is the, like, what's the best way to, uh, what's a way in which, like, if I'm going to dedicate my time to go out and, 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 and pitch and, and, and take away from product development or operations or growing the company, um, it really has to be worth it. And so the going to a private, uh, going to on the private side and working with a partner that can do all three, then um, that's a way better use of my time than even if the cost of capital is lower on the on the government side. Um, I think that if if the government can put a program that tackles all three, like fantastic. Um, but to date, we haven't seen that. Um, and and uh, uh, that being said, I do think that there's opportunities, um, especially I mean uh, Biden's you know kind of broadband um, and connectivity act that is um, in the telecom industry is taking place right now. It, it is a little bit influenced by the infrastructure bill, but not 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 fully. Um, the broadband is just really providing coverage to rural areas, and um, where we've been working with carers on figuring out how to, um, you know, how to get government to support that growth with renewable energy. And so it's an area we, we haven't quite figured it out, and that's where what we're working towards. But right now we rely on on, on public cap, on private capital. Great. Yeah, I think what you're um, explaining right there and highlighting is sort of why we're seeing the DOE focus a lot on how it's um, making the process easier for entrepreneurs and that sort of thing. Um, so one thing, we're getting a bunch of questions now asking a little bit about VCs and how you work with your VCs and how they help with financing, but also we wanted to talk about just, you know, pitching to VCs um, as female entrepreneurs in this space, you know, research shows that when women pitch to VCs, they're often asked, you know, what are the barriers to your business? And men, by contrast, are often asked to discuss their growth plans. Um, what's your advice for, you know, women entrepreneurs is how to pitch their funders and how to pitch private capital funders? And how have you approached uh, funding rounds to grow your companies? Um, Janice, we'll start with you. Um, yeah, so I was speaking to one of my friends who's also a, a founder, a female founder. And we were talking about this concept of, you know, women being discriminated uh, and sub subconsciously discriminated in, in VC meetings. Um, I personally haven't seen a, a lot of it, uh, but it's it's probably there. I think it's definitely there. But anyways, what, what, what my friend was telling me about is, I think one of the reasons why that happens, it's a, it's a pattern matching bias. So when a VC comes in, because VCs are not meant to be specialists, a deep specialist in any one um, area. They're kind of generalist and they need to make a lot of different bets. Um, so they can't have the time to go deep. And so they rely on pattern matching. And so when, you get a, when you're getting a VC and sometimes when you're getting customers, you know, there's also plus of customers, they're not familiar with what you're offering, they'll pattern match. And if their pattern, their series of pattern matching is that, you know, older white men uh, typically return 10, 20 X, then that's what they're gonna rely on and it might be subconscious. The way that you can actually uh, crack that pattern is maybe bringing a specialist in, someone who can, where they don't have to rely, uh, base rely on this pattern matching, but also but rely on another type of pattern or cue. Um, so that's one thing that she brought up that I thought was really interesting um, that maybe you know I wanna try out the next time. I think for, for me, the the capital community in the climate tech space has been more um, friendly towards uh, female female raises and female founders. Um, where I see this challenge the most is actually in my customers. So my customers are heavy industrial companies, uh, a lot of oil and gas, cement, steel, fertilizer companies, for example. Um, and the majority of the people that I interact with on the other side are older white men. And so having to you know, remove their pattern matching um, and come across in a different way that's also appealing to them um, and and is, you know, a, a trying to be a part of their tribe, but obviously not looking that way um, has been a interesting kind of challenge in itself. Um, but we are getting, you know, traction in order. So it's, it's not fully there, but I definitely see it more on the customer side. 
Yeah, that's a really interesting point. There's uh, so many different ways um, to get capital, including revenue. That's part of the thing. Um, so Alexander, tell us uh, your experience uh, going to VCs. Um, we'd love to hear that. And then we'll start going into more some questions from the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be, I'll be quick on that side. Um, I would say that um, so, so as long as you're you're prepared and you um, so as long as you're prepared, I think, and you have the backing that of oh, the skill set and the knowledge about the specific industry and you've really kind of thought it out, independent of your man or a woman or, or a minority, like ultimately that that level of preparedness is, I think, something that comes across. Uh, the other side, the, the table pretty easily. And so to, to your point, I don't know if it's been a bias that maybe some people haven't been prepared, but I would say I haven't experienced really any, um, you know, as a as minority and as a woman, I don't, I don't, I haven't experienced any type of, um, to any type of disconnect with respect to um, opportunities on the, on the investment side. In fact, um, what I seek out is usually minority investors as well. I seek out like my uh, one of uh, one of our investors is a female led uh, like private equity fund. Um, and then we're, we're bringing in I'm bringing in more, more Latinos into our, our cap table and things like that. But that's something I seek out because I do think there's value in diversity, um, not only diversity in people, but diversity in like the, the 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 funds that are coming in as well, um, but I will will echo that are on the customer side is where we experience the most amount of of uh, is definitely where we experience the most amount of, of bias in terms of uh, of gender bias, um, and uh, I spend a lot of time not only in the U.S. but also um, in Latin America. We 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 have a uh, we have an office in in. Colombia and an office in Central America. And we sell a lot to the Central American market. And there is a very, very obvious uh, gap, uh, obvious gap there. And um, usually I'm the only one in the room that's a woman. Um, and they'll address questions to, you know, my engineering team or my technicians instead of me. And so, uh, but I'll say, 20 minutes in when I start answering, okay, they start paying attention. <laughs> Um, and that's happened so many times to me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, but the other, the other, the other interesting thing is like, I, you know, I did spend time in the Middle East and, uh, we're, we're actively entering the Middle East in markets right now. And, um, you know, it's been a very welcoming, uh, it's been a very welcoming region of the world that I, that it was pleasantly surprising. I'll say that. Um, and so that's just a, a little bit of a optimism view, maybe, uh, or, you know, or just uh, putting my thoughts maybe too, too straightforward, but um, yeah. no, that's great, Alex. I appreciate that because um, I think one of the things we talk about at Generate all the time is that the energy industry that we're building for the future shouldn't look like the energy industry of the past, where um, maybe actually utilities have to have some diverse leadership because of the government background and connection often, um, and sort of like almost like a quota before the utilities have a little bit more diversity, but like sometimes other customers and other energy companies in the space are, they, they don't in that space. So um, it's interesting to think about as you're building the company and you're building a team and you're building um, growth opportunities in this space, you know, how do you think about having this like social and equity component in your teams? We had a question come in on that um, as you're sort of trying to build these energy companies for the future. Janice? Yeah, I think about this a lot. Um, we, we have this unique opportunity and time to rebuild the infrastructure. Um, so we should do that from the social side as well. So I completely agree with that. Um, we do have troubles with it because um, I think there was someone's question here, you know, how many, how many female electrical engineers do you know? Uh, how many electrical engineers do I know? Not many. It's actually a field that not as many people go into to begin with. And then, you know, female electrical engineers, well, that's even harder. So I think there is like, there is a funnel problem, but that's not an excuse. Um, you know, we have, when what we've realized with, with Canon, and by the way, we're hiring. <laughs> so uh, come onto our job page if you're looking for, you know, work in the sector. Um, but we, we have to like actively seek out uh, places where there are women engineers or we have to cultivate it. Um, and so going like straight to universities from uh, graduate school uh, and, and yeah, just making yourself embedded in these in these networks. Um, also, 
women, one of the big statistics of women is they don't like to apply for a job until they know that they've hit like all the criteria. Um, and so, you know, understanding that, um, you know, the women that are trying to get those women that are, you know, will apply as a stretch candidate that we would still love to hire. Um, so it's keeping in mind all the biases and all the ways that women tend to work, probably an advantage because I am a woman and trying to cater to that as well, um, how you craft, how you actually go and recruit. Great. Um, yeah, I'll, Alex, I'd love to hear how you think about that as well. Um, and just building your team in this space. And I think we also got a question, maybe you can add this to this too, whether you have, how you think about R&D as part of your team. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, so we, we try to, we try to give everybody equal, I think, opportunity in terms of, um, in terms of um, interview and interview process. Um, and even when we either work with recruiters or the majority of times I actually do the recruiting, um, I, I, I look for, for a wide range. And so, um, but yes, most of the time there's a lot of, um, there's not a lot of women in um, the electrical field, yes. And also the telecom field is even, I would say even darker. <laughs> um, there's a lot of like you know, kind of radio frequency and, and, and other different types of fields that are, um, you know, very, very male dominated. But just to, for interesting context, I did my master's at Berkeley. Half of the half of the um, half of my class was uh, was female at Proterra. Half of the team was female. So it, this is doable. It's just how do we get get the right people in the right places and give them the support that they need to keep growing. Um, as a, in a startup, I must admit that that's very tough because you need a job to get done and you need a job to get you need that job to get done right away. And so it is, it, it's the, it's um, the kind of the, as we grow, we can continue to support that. Um, but definitely in the, in the short term, it is, you, you need somebody who's, who's, who's ready to be, who's ready to work and who has experience. Um, it, the question around R&D, uh, do you mind reading it out? I don't see it. Just if you have an R&D team in your company um, and how you um, execute on ideas, before building yes. the company, we we have a we have an R and D team in the in the company. There's about 20 engineers in that team. Uh, it's divided by mechanical, um, electrical systems, uh, firmware, and and, and hardware and uh, cloud based. Um, we are always improving the product, whether that's um, whether that's brand new products, whether that's uh, cost reduction, whether that's reliability, whether that's new materials, whether that's a new microprocessor, as we've seen in the supply chain issues that we've been having in the past couple of years, um, we've seen over the past couple of, this past couple of months, uh, we've have to shift from a specific microprocessor because the lead time became 72 weeks until we got that microprocessor. So for example, we had to, pivot a little bit in how we how we deal with our firmware. And so that's why we keep, um, that's why we we make sure that we always keep uh, an eye on what's going on in the, in the broader, broader, broader landscape of, of development. Um, in terms of how do we think about new product and strategy and all of that, I am of the firm, I'm a firm believer in going out to the market, pitching an idea or a product, and then once you get confirmation that somebody's going to buy what you're selling, go and figure out how to develop it, but not the other way around, um, because it is it is it is deadly to go down a an entire development process where you spend you know five six million and sometimes when you go high voltage even twenty million into a development of a product that you may not it may not meet meet all the requirements of a specific customer. So you gather information from the market. Um, you gather information from a product side and then you execute. Um, and, uh, and the way that we think about new product with our customers is um, the telecom industry sort of mapped out into kind of different sub, sub segments from mobile sites to fixed, fixed network, which includes fiber and then eventually edge data centers. And so the way that we think about growth is actually we already talked to our customers that we have today to figure out what are your, um, what are your, what's your vision for the next couple of years and where, where do you, where do you require the most amount of support with, the, with respect to infrastructure and energy? And that's how we come up with new products. 
Yeah, that's such a great point about anticipating what the customer needs and how critical that is to like making sure you're going down the right path. Um, just a follow up question on both of this and sort of taking one of the questions from here. So our, our last question, you know, we got a question that came in on risk management um, in this space. And that's such a critical part of getting infrastructure products off the ground and just assuring people that you have risks contained and controlled. And obviously right now we live in this time of supply chain, you just mentioned inflation. Um, how do you think about, you know, solving some of those challenges to grow your business and you know what's the opportunity there as well as the challenge um so janice why don't you start and then we'll go to alexandra and then we'll wrap up yeah i think as a as a leader you're constantly have your i kind of, i say have your head in the clouds but your feet uh, planted firmly on the ground when i say have your feet planted in the ground it's making sure that you're in touch with the realities of what you're you know, cash flow, um, projections, things like that, as well as supply chain issues. And so managing risk is really about the numbers and the facts and always being, we have this, this concept called productive paranoia and within our founder, me and my two founders, we always talk about like, what is the worst thing that could possibly happen? Um, but inherently we're all very, big optimist. So, you know, we force ourselves to think, well, what are the worst things that can happen? How do we mitigate it? And then, and then you kind of go forward with these expectations that it could happen and you've planned a, around it. Um, and after, you know, kind of creating, you know, a billion doomsday scenarios in your head, it kind of comes natural and you kind of have that on default, probably being a project and project finance investors helped in that way too. Um, but risk management is less about, you know, actuarial models when you're a startup at, at the phase that we are and more about like, what are all the different things that can go wrong and, and always seeing around the corner um, and mitigating them. Great, uh, Alexandra, how do you address those? Uh, you talked a little bit about supply chain and stuff, but like inflation and just going through all the different challenges and risk management to get uh, to your ultimate scale goal. Yeah, I mean, there is definitely, so there's multiple facets of, of risk, I think. One is product risk, the other one's people risk, which we don't, talk about that often as a startup company, you have one person for one role and that what happens if that person leaves, right? Um, we also talk about, um, yes, funding, but more, more import most importantly, I think um, timing, right? If one thing doesn't happen at the right time, what then? And so to build up kind of scenarios of, if this doesn't happen on time, I always like to think of having sort of the, 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 the plan of action as plan A, and have up to you know plan D in terms of if does, this doesn't happen, not because it, not because it you know something went horribly wrong, but because it got delayed. As an example, like that is things timing and things not happening on time, like funding, like deployments on time, things like that are probably more the the highest risk I think to any company because you're expecting that cash flow to come in, you're expecting you know, sort of specific output with, with inventory. And if it, one thing isn't on time, then all of a sudden you have you know, more inventory on hand than, 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 than revenue deployed. Um, so we, we look at different things. We look at product risk. Um, obviously, we in order to alleviate that, we do a lot of product development. We have our own, um, I'm sitting in our headquarters and we have our own um, kind of R&D lab that has, uh, that has uh, thermal chambers that has different types of cycling equipment so that we mitigate the product risk as much as possible. And then everything else is really execution risk around, um, you know, construction, logistics. Um, if you're, if you sit anywhere near a port, you would know logistics is a big issue right now. We have uh, boats sitting at the port that are you know, uh, almost 20, 30, in some cases, two months out. And so those are the types of things that, that we think through and it's just about planning, that's it. That's great. Well, this was just such a fascinating discussion. Um, I just wanna thank Alexandra and Janice for all your insights and thoughts and experiences. Um, this was really great to hear about um, just how to build an infrastructure company in, the, in this time um, where there's so much excitement about infrastructure, how to think about the energy transition, um, really great takeaways from the whole conversation here about being a woman in sort of the, in this space and an opportunity to just build a different kind of company um, going forward. So thank you, Amy, and to the um, Columbia Center on Energy Policy for hosting this discussion. And thanks again to Janice and Alexandra. And um, I'll pass it back to you to conclude.
So on mute. Thanks to everyone uh, for coming uh, and for our speakers for joining us today. And thank you to the audience for tuning in and for your great questions. Um, as we mentioned, the full video recording of this event will be available on the Center for Global Energy Policy's website in a few days. Um, our next event, uh, Climate Adaptation, Urban Rural Transformations in the Horn of Africa will be tomorrow, February 7th at noon. Uh, Women in Energy Program, we're, uh, we're planning an event in March. So uh, keep your eye out on the Greening Oil Company um, with uh, some sustainability and strategy people from different of the large international. So stay tuned for that. Uh, for a full calendar of the upcoming events, uh, visit the Center on Global Energy Policy online. Um, we hope you'll enjoy the rest of your day and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.